an uncomfortable war, whether it's this bump, handshake, elbow bump, or a hug. Would be surprised to be with him. Hey, hey, Sylvia knew exactly who the person was on the pitch. Okay, let's see. Remember, what is what is the month? What is special about this month? What Black History Month? Okay, and who do you have in your hand? Who's that a picture of? Do you know? You can't remember his name, but you do know the face. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you don't know his name, Mr. Ellis. Do you know his name? You know, it's, it's like Corey, really. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that person right there, his name is John Lewis, right? He was a very strong man, okay? Now, has anybody ever told you to get in good trouble? No, like your mom or dad has never said, go to school and I want you to get in good trouble today. Good trouble? <laughs> Literally, cat, you've never told them to get in good trouble. <laughs> your mom just told on you they said that you get in good trouble all the time well listen guys good trouble is something that john lewis told everybody to get in right he lived a long healthy life and he wanted people to always get into good trouble and the good trouble that he wanted people to get in was like loving people right when you go to school and somebody may need a pencil you have five pencils you share one of those pencils or if you see somebody needing help you help that person or if you see somebody that's down you love that person right so here's a little book that miss ck actually gave to me last sunday and i'm going to read you a little bit about john lewis it says have you ever felt upset when you saw someone treated unfairly were you brave enough to do something to help? 
Well, you should meet John Lewis. When John was a small boy, he cared for the chickens on his family farm. His family didn't believe the chickens were very smart, but John thought that they were as special as any other animals. He cared even no one, even when nobody else did. And as John grew up, he cared about how people were treated too. He spoke about how laws that treated African Americans were unfair. And he was brave enough to get into what he called good trouble to help change those laws. So once you meet him, you'll be able to see how he went from a small Alabama farm to the halls of the Congress. Second. Now, do you know the other person, the picture that you're right there, Miss Betty? Do you know who that other person is in that picture that's putting on that, that necklace around him? That is President Barack Obama. Now, President Barack Obama actually gifted um, John Lewis that award. It was the Presidential Medal of Freedom Award in 2011. And that is the highest award somebody like me and you can get. And that's because John Lewis always asks people to get in good trouble. So think about this. Maybe if you guys ask people to get in good trouble, or maybe if you get in good trouble, you too will get the highest award that anybody has ever got. But you got to get in good trouble. Okay? Y'all agree to get in some good trouble this week? Yeah, I think I'm going to get in some good trouble too. All right, let's go ahead and go back to the back so we can finish our craft. Thank y'all. Please. Pray with me. Let us pray. God, we pray for your elimination over this text and a blessing upon the meditation and proclamation of good news today. Amen. Our text this morning is different from what is printed in your bulletin, but you can find it as a printout. It's in three parts. It comes from the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, from the 22nd chapter, verses 35 through 53. He said to them, when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, no, not a thing. He said to them, but now the one who has a purse must take it and likewise a bag, and the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. And indeed, what is written about me is also being fulfilled. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, it is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief, and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? But then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers, to the holy police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come, without, have you come with swords and clubs as though I were a rebel? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, 
want to thank Evergreen for the chance to um, share this with you today. I'm sorry that uh, Patrick is sick. Um, I will discuss police violence throughout the sermon. Just want you to be forewarned. Um, I will interpret this passage as it is revealed to me in my context as a middle class white man. Interpretation from my context will not be right for all contexts. We're about to climb in a hole together, but I promise we're going to climb out by the end. I've only called the cops once in my whole life. It was actually on a friend of mine named Roy. I met Roy when he lived outside, but by this time he was actually living indoors in a care home. His disability check paid for room and essentials in a house with nursing staff. Now, Roy had paranoid schizophrenia, which he'd managed for most of his life using crack. Crack is accessible, quetiapine is not. For the past several months, he'd been sober, he'd been on real meds, and he'd been indoors. But I got a call that morning from the staff of the care home. Roy had attacked one of the nurses and fled. Now, I selected this reading because it contrasts two visions of safety. One vision turns to the sword for protection, and one vision rejects the sword and turns to healing. Now, the interpretation of sell your cloak and buy a sword is debated even by Bible scholars. I don't have the knowledge to defend one of those interpretations over another. But the one that I find the most compelling turns upon a common biblical storytelling device called chiasm. C-H-I-A-S-M. It's a story where the first half is a mirror image of the back half. And the name comes from the Greek chi, which is an X shape. So it's a mirror, it's symmetrical, right? So this story is a chiasm. Look how Luke has written two scenes with swords separated by a middle scene. And the chiasm actually extends even further than that. Right before this passage, is Jesus foretelling that Peter will deny Jesus. And then right after this passage is when Peter actually does it. So we have this mirror image. So then we can look at these two sword passages and try to understand what is it about these two that is being contrasted. So the sword scenes are mirrors. In the first sword scene, Jesus predicts the way that all of the disciples will deny him. Just as he started with predicting Peter's denial, he then opens it up to the whole group. What he's doing is predicting that they will all deny him. And then in the second, and also that he will be counted among the lawless, quoting scripture. And then in the opposite sword scene, those words come to pass. Now, a couple hours after I got the call about Roy, he showed up on my doorstep. He was high. He was scared. And I was scared, too. Not of him, but of what would happen to him. He told me what happened. The nurse had his money and he wanted it and she wouldn't give it to him. So he took it from her. I knew from the care home that the nurse wasn't seriously hurt. I, I thought the most unsafe path for Roy at this point would be to go back to the streets because he'd go on a bender to end all benders. He would lose access to his medication the cops would be looking for him on assault charges. They'd probably injure him when they found him or worse. So I convinced Roy to turn himself in. And I called the cops. And they took him to jail. And he died there after nearly a year of pretrial detention. Didn't even get to a trial. His death was ruled a suicide. And then just this morning, Ben told me about, I told me to look in the paper, a man named Gershon Freeman died in 201 just last year and on October, and the autopsy results were just obtained by the press. He was beaten by corrections officers, and he died. So this is still happening. I turned to the police because I thought they could keep Roy safe, but the reality was nothing like it. Imprisonment with no end in sight made him suicidal. He never even got to trial. We locked Roy up until Roy gave up. 
I think of Roy when I think about the things we want police to do for us. We want them to make us safe. We want them to deal with people we think are unsafe. In the end, that means we want them to do violence to people that we think are unsafe. Chase them, brutalize them if necessary, imprison them, try not to kill them if you can avoid it. I know what our system of safety did to Roy, and now we know what it did to Gershon Freeman and Tyree Nichols and Demario Perkins and Darius Stewart and Justine Vanderpool. I could go on. We know what the system of safety did to them. What does it do to the people doing the violence work? What does it do to us? To paraphrase Mark Twain, when you have prayed for safety through policing, you have prayed for many unmentioned results which follow safety through policing. Must follow it. Cannot help but follow it. Last month, Tyree Nichols was beaten to death by our police force. In December, MPD killed three unconnected people in 12 days. What happened to them cannot help but follow from the way that we seek safety every night by sending police in search of unsafe people to receive our violence. That scripture Jesus quotes, counted among the lawless, is from Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Isaiah describes a servant of God who achieves greatness not by conquering or dominating, but by suffering for the sins of many. Without violence or deceit, the servant makes many righteous. And when I reread that this week, I was struck by the silhouette of Tyree Nichols in the stanzas. I'll read it to you or start part of it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. When the temple police come to arrest Jesus, and I didn't change that translation, that's how it's translated in the NRSV. They come with swords and the disciples fight back with swords, fulfilling Jesus's prediction that they put their faith in violence instead of in God. And what is Jesus's response? Does he give up on them? Does he give up on them? No. Does he punish them? No. no. Does he lock them away in hell? No. Does he smite them with divine fury? Does he give up their souls as lost causes? Does he waver an inch from his commitment to love all humanity? No. What does Jesus do when all around him are lost in violence? He says, no more of this. He heals the wounds of his enemy. And he asks a question. Have you come out with swords and clubs as though I were a rebel? That word rebel is translated elsewhere in Luke as robber. Like the robbers in the Good Samaritan. Or the den of robbers from the temple riot scene. Jesus asks everyone, including the disciples, is this who I am to you? 
a robber, an unsafe person who must be dealt with by violence. And then Jesus permits them to take him, to humiliate him, and to crucify him. If I was one of those disciples who was told to put away my sword, I'd be furious at Jesus. I'd be at his tomb, screaming at the stone. This is why we need swords. You didn't do anything. Satan came to kill you, and you just let him do it. And you've left us alone and defenseless, and you're dead, and it's all over. But I would be wrong. Jesus did do something when Satan came for him. It says at the beginning of the chapter that Satan enters into Judas. So when Judas comes with that mob, it's Satan leading the mob. But Jesus did do something. He demanded an end to the violence. He healed the wounded. And he poured himself out to death and made intercession for the transgressors. That ain't nothing. In fact, it's the way from death into life. And I wouldn't know yet if I was a disciple keening outside of Jesus's tomb that something surprising was happening in there. And the day after, when I got to see the risen Christ, I might start to understand. In the book of Acts, which is written by the same hand as the Gospel of Luke, we can see the disciples starting to get it. When the chief priests and the temple police threaten them, these are the very same people who had Jesus executed just weeks earlier. The disciples do not flinch. They preach the gospel to their faces. Then the chief priests start imprisoning the disciples and their followers, and they flog them. But the disciples don't stop, and their numbers keep growing. And the chief priests start executing followers of Jesus. But the followers of Jesus become even bolder. And they preach resurrection and forgiveness to the Gentiles. They heal the sick. They pray for God to forgive their persecutors. And they regard their persecutions as blessings from God. They get into good trouble. These are people who no longer fear death. They have left the sword behind. Their safety is in God, not guards. Easier said than done. But they didn't get there all at once. On Easter, they were hiding in a room, terrified, hoping no one would notice them. But they found that the more they trusted in the Holy Spirit, the more they started to replace violence with healing. Like the disciples, we turn to the sword for safety. Yet Jesus asked them, when I sent you without a purse or a bag or sandals, did you lack anything? And they did not. In panic, we strike against the ones we think are coming for us. But Jesus rebuked the disciples when they struck, and he healed the wounds of their enemies. We can change our minds and our choices. What might Jesus accomplish in us if we put away our swords? If we stop beating people up in the name of safety? If we stop spending millions of dollars a year on tanks and guns and spy gear? If we what? How? how I want to hear from you. How else? Could we put down the sword? Call it out. Provide health care. If we provide health care, what else? Mental health care. Mental health care. Education. Education? Well, and, and don't, that's, that's, this is great. How well, what could Jesus accomplish in us if we say no more of this violence? No more sending armed guards to extort fines and fees. No more justifying the killing of people we deem unsafe on the streets or in the prisons. What other violence do we say no more? No more for-profit prisons. No more guns. No more guns. No more war on drugs. Police in schools. Police in schools. No more. Tax breaks for the rich. No more tax breaks for the rich. 
Don't call the cops. That's how you say no more. No more border patrol. Border patrol, no more. What might Jesus accomplish in us if we heal the wounds left by violence? If we care for the traumatized? If we give back stolen resources? How else could we heal? Running for Head Starts instead of anti-abortion clinics? We'll heal with Head Start. Taking some of the 40% of the city budget to go to police and putting uh, at least 1% of it in our schools, public schools. So Funding the schools. Of city money. Refunding the city of Memphis and, and, and abortion clinics. I didn't mean to skip that. Mm -hmm. uh, having mental health professionals go out on mental health calls. Literally healing people. Instead of lower cost of higher education. More education, accessible education. If we, we built our way of living on a foundation of violence, is it any wonder that we are surrounded by death? But Jesus showed us the way from death into life that night on the Mount of Olives. And he asks us for, to pray for the faith to follow him. And that's the middle section of the chiasm. In a chiasm, the middle section is the hinge on which the story turns. And the hinge of this passage is Jesus praying and asking the disciples to pray with him. But they succumb to exhaustion and to grief. And when the time of trial comes, they do not have the faith to keep Jesus' teaching. We are exhausted. We are grieving. And the temptation of the sword is upon us. Let us pray for the faith to seek safety in Jesus, not jailers, not through guns, but through God. Amen. Amen. Now is the time in our service where we practice silence. And if you're like me, it can be very difficult to allow yourself the time and space to fully appreciate this practice. And I think it's important to be able to do so after such a powerful message from Adam. So I'd like to share a few words from the poem Desiderata that I hope will be helpful. Um, I will read those, then uh, we'll ring the chime to bring us into our time of silence, and then we'll shortly later ring the chime to bring us out. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul.
We have a really special guest for the operatory anthem music today. Um, and also just on the heels of Adam's, thank you so much for your message today and Joanna for your beautiful silence. Um, if you are anything like me, I think sometimes we, there is so much to be aware of that uh, it can be hard to feel a sense of urgency or we feel only a sense of urgency and it's hard to figure out where to direct our energy. But um, if we're struggling to figure out like when is the time to take an action, um, I heard Corey sing this uh, in a video a few months ago and I was just deeply moved by this song, which is his own composition, uh, the lyrics, the title to which is If Not Now, When? Um, so Corey's going to share our operatory anthem today, so please enjoy this uh, composition of his. Thank you, Kathy. It's the world gon' change, everything is still the same We got to say the name so they can feel our pain Cause we need justice, we need peace Not to be shot down to our knees When it's the world gon' change, everything is still the same Hey, they so traumatizing all our people Even though they try to say that we're all people Even though they try to say that we're all free uh, I'm sorry Hey, uh, got black lives matter Big boys around the town But we stand by and raise our fish Because it's out uh, Say we're out of line and being too aggressive When I was on the axe in the quest When it's the world gon' change Everything is still the same We got to say their name So they can feel our pain Cause we need justice, we need peace Not to be shot down to our knees When it is the world Don't change, everything is still the same Hey, most mornings when I wake up It's the same old, I try to make it my day Can't let them do you lie down Gotta let the thing shine, gotta go and let it out I don't know what's gonna happen next If I have when can you tell me what's next When will the world change, will it always stay the same Yeah, when it's the world don't change Everything is still the same We got to say their name so they can feel our pain Cause we need justice, we need peace Not to be shot down to the armies When it's the world gon' change Everything is still the same Hey, if it isn't one thing, it's another I can't go up for going down As the old mother said I'm almost level to the ground and here's the problem, and there's the problem, and everybody seems to think the man or the woman in the White House is solved. When TV comes on, breaking news is on, and you see another black soul that's lost. So you tell me, peace paying the cost, and when you figure out that cost, I want you to tell me why we kill people who kill people so the killer people is wrong. Ain't no justice for the brothers. They're supposed to protect and serve, and we're supposed to stand together as a people. They do say that we're all created equal, but where exactly are we equal? Why do we have to live in fear? They fear the black man, yet we fear those in blue. Y'all, sooner or later, sooner or later, we gonna need a sign from above, because where's the peace of love? We gonna need that sign from above, because ain't no justice for the brothers, y'all. Thank y'all so much.
Let us pray. God, if not now, then when? We ask for a blessing upon all that we offer to you and to each other and to our neighbors. May we be a blessing to all. Amen. I invite you to rise as we sing our doxology together. Peace there. Amen. 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 